Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Wednesday, June 8th, 2022. An 11-year-old girl who survived the mass shooting in Uvalde, Texas by smearing on her the blood of those who were shot and then playing dead, telling a U.S. House committee in Washington that she wants children to have security. But when asked if she now feels safe at school, shaking her head no. U.S. House Democratic majority moving to pass a series of bills to address gun violence over the objections of the Republican minority. The changes include increasing the age to buy an AR-15 style rifle and banning high capacity magazines. An armed man arrested outside the home of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh, calling 911 on himself and saying he was there to kill the justice. The man has now been charged with attempted murder of a judge. One day until the House Select Committee on the investigation of the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol's nighttime hearing, 8 p.m. Eastern Thursday, we'll have live coverage on the C-SPAN networks. And during today's Washington Today, we'll hear from a Democratic committee member, also a member of the House Republican leadership criticizing the work of the committee. And we will speak with a Washington Post reporter about the witness lineup. Two views on U.S.-Latin American relations and the Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles from Vice President Kamala Harris and Republican Congresswoman Maria Salazar. Plus, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen questioned by House members about the global corporate minimum tax proposal. Now to the House Oversight and Reform Committee hearing on gun violence. Some of the witnesses today, survivors and families of victims from the mass shootings in Uvalde, Texas and Buffalo, New York. One Mia Surio, fourth grader at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, where 19 children and two teachers were shot dead last month. She testified by recorded video about how her class was watching a movie when her teacher received an email about an active shooter. We were just watching a movie, and then she got an email, and then she went to go lock the door, and he was in the hallway, and they made eye contact, and then she went to, back in the room and she showed us, go hide, and then we went to go hide behind my teacher's desk and behind the backpacks, and then he shot the little window, and then he went to the other classroom, and then he went, there's a door between our classrooms, and he went to there and shot my teacher and told my teacher goodnight and shot her in the head. And then he shot some of my classmates and the whiteboard. When I went to the backpacks, uh, he shot my friend that was next to me. And I thought he was gonna come back to the room. So I grabbed the blood and I put it all over me. And what did you do then when you put the blood on yourself? Just stay quiet and then I got my teacher's phone and called 911. What did you tell 911? I told her that we need help and to send the police in, the, in our classroom. If there was something that you want people to know about, that day and about you, right? Or things that you want different, what would it be? To have security. Do you feel safe at school? Why not? Because I don't want it to happen again. And you think it's going to happen again? Video testimony of fourth grader Mia Cerillo before a U.S. House committee on Capitol Hill that voice asking the questions off camera and the, the young girl does not at the end yes in answer to that question. Do you think it's going to happen again? Another witness at today's hearing, Kimberly Rubio, the mother of Lexi Rubio, one of the students shot dead in Uvalde. We don't want you to think of Lexi as just a number. She was intelligent, compassionate, and athletic. She was quiet, shy, unless she had a point to make. But she knew she was right. She so often was, stood her ground. She was firm, direct, voice unwavering. So today, 
We stand for Lexi. And as her voice, we demand action. We seek a ban on assault rifles and high capacity magazines. We understand that for some reason, to some people, to people with money, to people who fund political campaigns, that guns are more important than children. So at this moment, we ask for progress. We seek to raise the age to purchase these weapons from 18 to 21 years of age. We seek red flag laws, stronger background checks. We also want to repeal gun manufacturers' liability immunity. You've all seen glimpses of who Lexi was, but I also want to tell you a little bit about who she would have been. If given the opportunity, Lexi would have made a positive change in this world. She wanted to attend St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas on a softball scholarship. She wanted to major in math and go on to attend law school. That opportunity was taken from her. She was taken from us. I'm a reporter, a student, a mom, a runner. I've read to my children since they were in the womb. My husband is a law enforcement officer, an Iraq war veteran. He loves fishing and our babies. Somewhere out there, there is a mom listening to our testimony, thinking I can't even imagine their pain, not knowing that our reality will one day be hers. Unless we act now. Kimberly Rubio, the mother of 10-year-old Lexi Rubio, one of the children shot and killed at the elementary school in Uvalde, Texas last month, testifying alongside her husband at today's House Oversight and Reform Committee hearing. A full day of, of the hearing on gun violence. Many more witnesses. We covered it all, and you can find the video at cspan.org. While that was happening, there was debate and votes on the U.S. House floor on a package of bills designed to address gun violence written by the Democratic majority. They named it the Protect Our Kids Act. Among the provisions, it would raise the age to purchase AR-15 style rifles to 21, put restrictions on high capacity magazines, have safe storage requirements for firearms in people's homes, prevent gun trafficking and address ghost guns, also targeting what is called the bump stock loophole requiring de- devices that uh, re- that increase the rate of fire for these rifles to make the rifles then be registered as machine guns. Expected in a separate bill to be debated and voted on Thursday, creating a federal red flag law allowing family members and law enforcement to temporarily block firearm access to those the court determined pose a danger to themselves or others. Here's some of the floor debate. First speaking in favor, the House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, Democrat from California. All of our kids must and should feel safe, whether at school, in church, at the movies, or any other place. Protecting our children can and must be a unifying mission for our nation because they are, our, as I said, our national treasure. That is why, under the unyielding leadership of our chairman, Mr. Nadler, uh, the House will pass protecting our, the Protecting Our Children's Act today. This bold package includes common sense measures that will make an enormous difference to save lives. Who wouldn't vote to raise the age from 18 to 21 of a, uh, for a person to have a weapon of war? Who wouldn't vote to raise the age to take weapons of war out of the hands of teenagers? Who wouldn't vote to get illegal guns off of our streets by cracking down on gun trafficking, which is a danger to people but also to law enforcement? Who wouldn't vote for background checks on ghost gun purchases, which our law enforcement tells us is a major concern out there? Who wouldn't vote to protect children from stolen weapons or accidental shootings with safe storage requirements? safe storage requirements. Who wouldn't vote to ban bump stocks? That was President Trump's executive order. Bump stocks from civilian use or outlawing high capacity magazines designed for massacres, not for killing varmints. These measures will not only help stem the tide of mass murder, but address the equally urgent and wide range of daily gun deaths. Let us salute the many members who have worked 
persistently to craft this strong legislation written to earn bipartisan support of the Amer- that the American people expect and deserve. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi debating on the House floor. Rising to oppose this package of bills changing gun laws, Congressman Jim Jordan of Ohio. He's the ranking Republican on the Judiciary Committee. What happened in Uvalde, Buffalo, Tulsa is as wrong as wrong could be. And our hearts go out to those communities and those families who have been impacted in such a, such a terrible way. But the answer is not to destroy the Second Amendment. But that is exactly where the Democrats want to go. You don't have to take my word for it. Just look what they said. The President of the United States said last week that he wants to get rid of the most popular handgun in the country. Michael Moore, Democrat, not a member of Congress, but Democrat, said that it's time to repeal the Second Amendment. During our 10-hour markup last Thursday in the committee hearing, Representative Jackson Lee says, if this bill passes, we're not finished. Representative Jones said, if this bill doesn't pass, we will end the filibuster, we will expand the Supreme Court, we will do whatever it takes to get people's law-abiding American citizens guns. Today we have this hodgepodge, six bills thrown together. Many of the elements in these bills are unconstitutional. Even the Ninth Circuit has said it's unconstitutional, what they want to do on the age limit. These bills would say, when you can buy a firearm, what kind of firearm you can get, and where and how you have to store that firearm in your own darn home. And of course, tomorrow, tomorrow they're bringing the red flag law, so-called red flag law to the floor. Someone who doesn't like you can file a complaint within 24 hours. There is a hearing that you're not allowed to be at. You can't confront your accuser, and they can take away your Second Amendment liberty. That's the bill they're going to pass tomorrow. Congressman Jim Jordan on the House floor. After the House passes these bills, they'll send them to the Senate where they would await action. There are two other bills already that the House passed and pending in the Senate. They passed them last year would expand criminal background checks prior to gun purchases. As this is happening, a bipartisan group of senators are continuing to meet this week discussing possible bipartisan response to the mass shootings. Tentative deadline for reaching some deal is the end of this week, according to the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. More from the House floor today, it is the majority Democrats who control the schedule, bringing up the bills that they wish to put on the agenda each day. But the minority Republicans made it clear that if they had the ability to set the agenda, there was one bill dealing with violence and crime that they would have brought up today. Congress Woman Michelle Fishbach, Republican from Minnesota, explains and refers to an election from Tuesday in which voters in San Francisco recalled the district attorney. Madam Speaker, while my colleagues in the majority believe that the best approach to addressing violence is to strip away American constitutional rights, Republicans stand with parents and communities to in, in ensuring those who commit crimes are prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law and those who don't will be held accountable. Just last night, families in San Francisco ousted their attorney, district attorney for failing to keep their streets free from criminals. Americans are fed up with liberal prosecutors letting criminals run rampant for the sake of woke idealism. This legislation will ensure the Department of Justice and the American public have the data and information necessary to hold those responsible for keeping our streets safe accountable. Congresswoman Michelle Fishbach, Republican from Minnesota, on the House floor today. House Republicans attempting to use a procedural vote to bring up that bill, but they were not successful in bringing it to the floor. About that election, CBS News reporting San Francisco residents voted overwhelmingly Tuesday to recall District Attorney Chesa Bodine, one of the nation's most progressive top prosecutors. Partial results from the San Francisco Department of Elections on Tuesday night showed the recall measure, also known as Proposition H, had the support of nearly 60 percent of voters, with 40 percent voting against it. The CBS News article continues, Bodine sought to reform the criminal justice system, ending the use of cash bail, stopping the prosecution of minors as adults, and focused on lowering jail populations amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Bodine also became the first San Francisco DA to file homicide charges against city police officers. 
Also this from CNN in the Los Angeles mayor's race where public safety concerns have also taken center stage. Billionaire real estate developer Rick Caruso, former Republican who vowed a tough on crime approach, is headed to a runoff against California Congresswoman Karen Bass. A few of the high profile elections from Tuesday, California and a half dozen other states holding primaries. And President Joe Biden reacting to all this as he left the D.C. area flying to Los Angeles for the Summit of the Americas. I've got a brief statement I'm going to make, if I can. I think the voters sent a clear message last night. Both parties have to step up and do something about crime as well as gun violence. And I sent, as you recall, with the first major bill we passed, we gave the states and localities billions of dollars, billions of dollars to have and encourage them to use it to hire police officers and reform the police department. Very few have done it. In addition to that, I sent the Congress a request for $300 million in this year's budget to deal with hiring cops, to retrain cops, as well as to make sure they are adequately dispersed around the communities. It's time they move. It's time the states and the localities spend the money they have to deal with crime, as well as retrain police officers, as well as provide for more community policing. It's time to get on with doing that, and that's what I think the message last night from the American public was in all the primaries. Thank you. President Joe Biden making that statement on the tarmac of Joint Base Andrews before flying out on Air Force One to Los Angeles for the Summit of the Americas. He didn't take any reporters' questions. Attorney General Merrick Garland today announcing the Justice Department will be conducting a critical incident review of the law enforcement response to the mass school, the mass shooting at the school in Uvalde, Texas. A Reuters article as this, the critical incident review is prompted by growing anger over a police failure to swiftly confront the gunman. The 18-year-old shooter was allowed to remain in a classroom at Robb Elementary School for nearly an hour while officers waited in a school hallway and children in class made panicked phone calls for help. A U.S. Border Patrol-led tactical team ultimately burst into the classroom and killed the gunman. That was from Reuters. Here's Attorney General Merrick Garland. We are gathered here because two weeks ago uh, at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, an unspeakable act of mass violence took the lives of 19 children and two of their teachers. Um, I, I know I speak for all of us, and I think I speak for everyone in the country, in saying our hearts are broken uh, by what happened in Uvalde. There is nothing uh, that we can do that can undo the pain uh, borne both by the survivors, the families of the victims, and the community, uh, and the country. Uh, but the independence um, uh, and transparency and expertise of the Justice Department can go a long way toward assessing what happened in Uvalde with respect to the law enforcement response and to giving guidance for the future. Uh, and that's what we're uh, here for today. The Justice Department is undertaking a critical incident review of the law enforcement response that day at the request of the Uvalde mayor. The review will be comprehensive. It will be a transparent and it will be independent. We will be assessing what happened that day. We will be doing site visits at the school. We will be conducting uh, interviews of uh, an extremely wide variety of stakeholders, witnesses, families, law enforcement, government officials, school officials. Um, and we will be reviewing the resources that were made available after the, um, in the aftermath. The review will culminate in a final report, which will include our findings and recommendations, and it will be made public. The department's COPS office um, is leading the review. Our um, uh, director, Rob Chapman, and our senior counselor, uh, Shanetta Cutler, um, will be leading the team. The Attorney General Merrick Garland at a roundtable at the Justice Department in Washington, D.C. with members of that team that will be conducting the review of the Evaldi mass shooting. Garland asked whether this was an assessment of possible criminal conduct. He said no. And after action review, 
similar to those done after uh, other mass shootings is being done. It'll determine lessons learned, best practices to help prevent, prepare for, and respond to future events. Attorney General Garland also asked today about, this is how NBC News reports it, an armed man was arrested overnight near the home of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh after he called 911 on himself, law enforcement officials said. Officials say the man identified as Nicholas John Roski, 26, was armed with a handgun, a knife, pepper spray, and burglary tools. He was stopped a block away from the Justice's house, and when police detained him, he said he was there to kill Kavanaugh, the officials say. Roski was charged in federal court in Maryland with attempting to murder a Supreme Court justice. Again, here is the question to the Attorney General. Mr. Attorney General, um, on the topic of gun violence, a man was arrested early this morning outside the home of Justice Brett Kavanaugh in Maryland uh, with a gun and a knife threatening to do harm to the justice. What is your reaction to this? So this kind of behavior is obviously is behavior that we will not tolerate. Threats of violence and actual violence against the justices, of course, strike at the heart of our democracy, and we will do everything we can to prevent them and to hold people who do them accountable. For that reason, last month, I accelerated uh, the protection of all the justices' residences 24-7. Also last month, I met with the marshal of the court. I, I, I convened a meeting with her, as well as with the deputy director of the FBI, with the director of the marshal service, um, and with our own uh, law enforcement, our own uh, prosecutors, to ensure every degree of protection available as possible. Just yesterday, I met with Judge Salas uh, and uh, Judge Sullivan on the Judicial Security Committee of the Judicial Conference and assured them of our complete support for their efforts uh, with respect to judicial security. Attorney General Merrick Garland. More on this from the NBC News article. Officials say the man had called 911 and said during the call that he had homicidal thoughts, had traveled from California to attack the justice, and had a gun in his suitcase. He said the gun was unloaded and in a locked case. Officials said the man is from Simi Valley. He was still on the phone with 911 when police showed up to arrest him, the complaint said. A search of his backpack and suitcase showed he was carrying a black tactical chest rig and tactical knife, a Glock 17 pistol with two magazines and ammunition, pepper spray, zip ties, a hammer, screwdriver, nail punch, crowbar, pistol light, and duct tape, and other items. That from NBC. U.S. House Republican Whip Steve Scalise from Louisiana also reacting. News conference on Capitol Hill. Uh, it's, it's angering when you see that there was a man arrested just a little while ago last night uh, out in front of Justice Kavanaugh's house trying to kill him. When we were vocal a few weeks ago, speaking out against this encouragement you saw from the White House on down to encourage people to go to the homes, the private homes of Supreme Court justices, it is a dangerous trend. Exercising First Amendment rights is one thing. Encouraging people to go to the homes of Supreme Court justices, you see where that can lead. And it's a shame. Um, thank God law enforcement was able to arrest the man who was intending uh, on committing that action. But uh, it just reminds us all, let's try to continue to focus on problems, not try to create problems. Congressman Steve Scalise, Republican from Louisiana, the minority whip at a news conference today in the U.S. Capitol. The Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell tweeting, This morning's disturbing reports are exactly why the Senate unanimously passed a Supreme Court security bill weeks ago, but House Democrats have inexplicably blocked it. House Democrats need to stop their blockade and pass this uncontroversial bill today. And some more details about the incident from the, the Washington Post. After his arrest, according to the affidavit, Nicholas John Roski told police he was upset over the leaked draft of an opinion that would overturn the constitutional right to abortion and also over the recent school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. He thought Justice Kavanaugh would support looser gun laws. He decided to kill Kavanaugh and then himself, according to the police officer, thinking it would give his life purpose. That from the Washington Post. The White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre telling reporters flying on Air Force One as the president went out to California, as the president has consistently made clear, public officials, including judges, must be able to do their jobs without concern for their personal safety or that of their families. Any violence or threat of violence or attempts to intimidate justice 
have no place in our society. Washington Today continues in a minute. Listen to C-SPAN Radio with our free mobile app, C-SPAN Now. Get complete access to what's happening in Washington, wherever you are, with live streams of floor proceedings and hearings from the U.S. Congress, White House events, the courts, campaigns, and more, plus analysis of the world of politics with our informative podcasts. C-SPAN Now is available at the Apple Store and Google Play. Download it for free today. C-SPAN Now, your front row seat to Washington, anytime, anywhere. Welcome back to Washington Today, which you can get as a podcast on the free C-SPAN Now mobile video app and wherever you get your podcasts. The House Select Committee on the Investigation of the January 6th Attack on the U.S. Capitol announcing the witnesses for Thursday night's hearing. It's airing at 8 p.m. Eastern Thursday, first of several public hearings this month. All will be live on C-SPAN radio and television. Those witnesses had direct contact with the group The Proud Boys on or around the events of January 6, 2021. Documentarian Nick Quested and Capitol Police Officer Carolyn Edwards, who was injured in clashes during the riot that day. We'll talk more about these witnesses coming up in a few minutes with a Washington Post reporter. First, Congressman Pete Aguilar, Democrat from California, a member of the Select Committee, getting reporters questions today about what to expect. Can you just help us understand on the eve of your committee's presentation the, the, the way the committee is going to tell the story? For example, will the committee use the recorded Roger depositions Bush. of Jerry Kushner and Ivanka Trump to tell the story of former President Trump's conduct? Uh, I'm not going to give you any pregame analysis um, on on the hearing tomorrow. Um, I'll let the the documents and the evidence uh, that's presented by the chair and vice chair tomorrow speak for itself. But what I can tell you is that the committee is in lockstep. Uh, We've worked uh, hard to gather this information, uh, to gather the evidence, uh, to come to this point, to be able to tell the truth and to share uh, uh, aspects of what we've learned. Um, And so we're ready. Uh, We're focused. We're ready. Uh, We're prepared. We continue to do preparation um, each and every day. Uh, All of us have spent time uh, on this. Uh, We look forward to sharing with the American public and with our colleagues uh, what we found. Are you convinced the committee is going to break through with the American people? All we can control is, is what's in front of us, and that's to, to tell that story. Uh, I hope that people pay attention. Uh, as the chairman outlined, this is, this is bigger than, than, than one hearing room and, and one committee. Uh, this is about protecting our democracy and the sanctity uh, of, what, of what happened uh, and the importance uh, of the topics that, that we're going to address. And many of the folks here in this room, you, were, you all lived through this just like we did. And so we owe it on ourselves. We owe it to each other. Uh, to tell this story right, uh, and to make sure that we do it in a thoughtful and deliberate way. And that's exactly what the committee is going to do. Congressman Pete Aguilar, Democrat from California, a member of the Select Committee on the investigation of the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol in a news conference today. He referred to the chairman standing beside him, Akeem Jeffries, chair of the House Democratic Caucus. Pete Aguilar happens to be the vice chair of that caucus. The Select Committee has seven Democrats and two Republicans. The Republicans were appointed by Democratic House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. This after House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy refused to appoint members from his party after Speaker Pelosi rejected two of McCarthy's proposed appointments. At a separate news conference today on Capitol Hill, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, Republican from New York, the House Republican Conference chair, with her own preview of Thursday night's hearing. Just this week, Nancy Pelosi's illegitimate January 6th committee secretly hired the former president of ABC News to produce these shameless primetime show. This was the same producer that covered up victims of Jeff Epstein. This further solidifies what we know, what we have known from day one. This committee is not about seeking the truth. It is a smear campaign against President Donald Trump against Republican members of Congress, and against Trump voters across this country. This committee is unconstitutional. It is illegitimate. It was not put together according to the rules of the House. It does not serve any true legislative or oversight purpose. And it is not about finding out why Nancy Pelosi left the Capitol so ill-prepared that day. 
It is designed to punish Nancy Pelosi's political opponents. And it will not prevent another January 6 from happening. And it does nothing to address the numerous crises Americans are suffering from because of Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi's radical far left agenda. So while Democrats obsess over this illegitimate hearing, House Republicans will be setting the record straight and telling the truth about lame duck speaker Nancy Pelosi's sham political witch hunt. And most importantly, we will continue to focus on the important issues that matter facing the American people and how to solve the crises that Joe Biden and House Democrats' far left agenda have created, from the border crisis to the baby formula shortage to inflation to soaring gas prices. Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, Republican from New York and chair of the House Republican Conference at a news conference. With more on what to expect at Thursday night's hearing of the House Select Committee on the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, we're joined on the phone by Philip Bump, national correspondent with The Washington Post. Thanks for being with us. You bet. The committee has officially named uh, the witnesses who will appear, and one of them is a documentary filmmaker that you've reported on. Who is he and what will he be saying? So uh, obviously we'll have to wait and see what he'll be saying, but he's expected to talk about a documentary he was working on in the period after the election that centered on the Proud Boys. Uh, The Proud Boys being uh, the, uh, by now, fairly well-known extremist group, uh, which had been pretty closely tied uh, to uh, its defense of Donald Trump. It was engaged in a lot of different uh, demonstrations and protests over the course of 2020, often uh, demonstrations that devolved into to, to street violence. Um, and they were broadly supportive of President Trump, had some connections to Trump's inner circle, primarily through Roger Stone, uh, Trump's longtime advisor. Uh, and they agreed to have a documentarian travel along with them. Uh, so the documentarian was there uh, during a lot of the period after the election and including in the days before and on January 6th itself. What do you think the meaning is that this is one of the first witnesses based on on what you've uh, written about? Well, I think the Proud Boys are interesting for a variety of reasons. I think there's there's no way one can argue that without the Proud Boys being there, there wouldn't have been a riot. I don't think the Proud Boys were instrumental in that way. But they really represent this interesting nexus of uh, proximity to Donald Trump, albeit not very close. You know, it's, there's no indication that Donald Trump or anyone in his really close inner circle was in contact with the Proud Boys or anything along those lines, uh, at least not yet. Uh, but they they had at least some access to Trump. They were one of several extremist groups that had planned ahead and thought about you know how they would prepare, came to Washington ready to engage in physical violence and ready to fight, uh, according to indictments that were obtained by uh, federal law enforcement, uh, and then proceeded to do that, proceeded to actually engage in actively being part of the attack at the Capitol. And the the indictments from the federal government suggest that they were, that the Proud Boys were present at two key moments uh, on that day. The first, when the first barrier was overturned on the northwest side of the Capitol, uh, that the guy who overturned that barrier had spoken with one of the Proud Boys immediately beforehand. And then that a member of the Proud Boys was actually the person who smashed that first window in the Capitol uh, about quarter past two on January 6th itself. And so the, the Proud Boys were not only had some links to Donald Trump's uh, team, but they were came there ready to fight. They were acting in response, uh, it seems pretty clearly, uh, to Donald Trump's tweet from December about how it would be wild, it would be a wild protest. And then they came there and actually engaged in violence. And the second witness who will appear Thursday night, a, a wounded police officer. Yeah, and I think that the, we've heard uh, from a number of police officers who were there on that day. Uh, their stories are compelling for a variety of reasons. Uh, I'm not sure if there is new information that that officer will have, um, but I think that the, the intent of the committee, at the very least, is to remind people of the human stakes here, that this, these were people who were not only attacking the Capitol, they were combating police uh, which is as you know concrete an example of criminality I think as you as you can imagine that they were battling police to do so leaving you know well over 100 police officers injured uh, over the course of, of the day's events and I think that that's they're, they're going to want to remind people that the stakes here are much broader than simply what happened with the electoral vote count we're talking with Philip bump from the Washington Post what else do we know uh, about how this hearing is going to play out Thursday night it's you know, getting close. Do we right. do we know how long it's going to be? Do we know the committee has been meeting now for for a year, uh, doing right. interviews, collecting information? Will we get new information out? How much video? How many photos? Have, have they talked about this? 
No, I mean, it's a, it's really sort of a black box. I think they're intentionally trying to keep their cards close to their chest. Uh, you know, I, I don't anticipate this will extend very long into the evening. Obviously, the part of the goal of their doing this when they're doing it is to try and keep people sort of intrigued, uh, you know, and, and, and treat it as, as something of a, uh, a bit of programming, if you will, not, not to be to course or oversimplify it, but they want people to be told a story about what happened on January 6th, and then they're, they're doing it in prime time for that reason. So I think it's safe to assume that there is some information which has not yet been made public, which they will release, uh, uh, in addition to allowing people to tell their own stories in a, in a way that they hope is compelling and, and really raises for people the sense of urgency around uh, understanding what happened on that day. Philip Bump, national correspondent with The Washington Post. Find his stories at WashingtonPost.com and on Twitter at Pete Bump. Thank you very much. You bet. Thanks. And you can listen to the House January 6th the Attack Committee hearing Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern here on C-SPAN Radio. On your smart speaker, say play C-SPAN Radio. It'll also be, of course, on C-SPAN Television, and you can follow it anywhere on the free C-SPAN Now mobile video app. President Joe Biden flying from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles today for the Summit of the Americas. Vice President Kamala Harris has been at the summit in L.A. for a couple of days. On Tuesday, she announced $1.9 billion more in private sector donations to increase job opportunities in Central America and address one of the root causes of migration from those countries to the U.S., This added to previously pledged $1.2 billion for a total of over $3 billion. Today, the vice president highlighting public-private partnerships as she spoke to company CEOs. When I think about all the challenges we face in the Western Hemisphere, I know that they will require new and innovative coalitions between the public and private sectors. One size does not fit all, of course, but think about it. Economic inequality in our hemisphere is among the worst in the world. Women and girls in our hemisphere face far too many barriers and far too few opportunities. Many countries in the region are still struggling to recover from the pandemic. Health systems are strained. The climate crisis is mounting. And we continue to see corruption, migration flows, and democratic backsliding and violence. These issues affect all of us. And the solutions, then, must involve all of us. I believe there is untapped potential for us to partner in these areas and so many more, in the area of clean energy, food security, health, supply chains, infrastructure, and more. Later today, President Joe Biden will officially open the Summit of the Americas to lay out his ambitious vision for shared prosperity in our hemisphere, now and into the future. Our ongoing partnership with the private sector will play a crucial role in realizing this vision. And I urge all of the leaders here to consider what you can continue to do to partner within the context of the vision I know we share. Needless to say, each of you here has the power to act, to help solve some of the most pressing challenges of our time. Our partnership can create new opportunities for individuals to not only succeed, but to thrive. For companies, it can create new opportunities to grow and to innovate. And for our hemisphere as a whole, it can create new opportunities to connect and to prosper. Vice President Kamala Harris at the CEO Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce explains it's partnering with the Department of State to host the fourth CEO Summit of Americas. It's the official private sector forum of the ninth Summit of the Americas, where the U.S. government hosts leaders from the Western Hemisphere. 
In Washington, D.C., Congresswoman Maria Elvira Salazar, Republican from Florida, joining other House Republicans at a news conference looking at the Biden administration's agenda for the summit. As you know, President Biden is on his way to Los Angeles um, and he's hosting a summit of the Americas in that city, in Los Angeles, as we speak. Uh, This event is just like his approach to Latin America has been since he got to the White House, uh, weak, disorganized, and misguided. This summit, like it was in 1992 with uh, 1994 with President Clinton in the city of Miami that I represent, is supposed to be the key strategy discussion for how we move forward as a region, as neighbors, with the United States leading, of course, the conversation. This is a position that the United States has held for, for centuries. Latin America looks towards the United States for guidance, for friendship, for help, and at this hour is simply not there. In the last 18 months, we have seen a complete failure of this tradition. Our Latin American allies are highly frustrated and tyrants and thugs, unfortunately, because of this behavior from the United States, are grasping power in our backyard. I mean Russia and China. The best example is the Mexican president, AMLO, Lopez Obrador, who took the most insulting position a Mexican president has ever taken in the last 100 years towards its northern neighbor, towards the United States. He made demands that he wanted his three best friends, listen, Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela, needed to be invited to this party in Los Angeles or else. Instead of shutting down, President Biden froze. AMLO did not come to the summit, and there are no consequences for it. Our president, the United States, should be leading instead of following. And let's look at the agenda that the United States presented for Latin America. COVID, climate change, gender ideology, nothing about the economy, nothing about trade, nothing about jobs discussion or tax incentives for American companies to land in Central America. Nothing about keeping Central Americans working at home instead of fleeing to our borders. You've heard that there is a new caravan coming. Obviously, if you don't have a job and there is no security in your country, you are going to come to try to live the American dream. Evident. The president wants to talk about immigration, as I'm saying about the border. But look at this. The presidents of Guatemala, of Honduras, and El Salvador are not here because they felt mistreated. So they did not attend the Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles. So how are we gonna be talking to countries that are exporting people if they are not present? Congresswoman Maria Salazar, Republican from Florida, a news conference outside the U.S. Capitol in Washington. As she mentioned, the first Summit of the Americas was 1994 in Miami, Florida. This year is the ninth summit and the first one that has returned to the U.S., being held in Los Angeles this week. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen back on Capitol Hill today testifying about the president's fiscal year 2023 request for the Treasury Department and the economy in general. Today it was before the House Ways and Means Committee. One of the issues raised an international agreement on a 15 percent global minimum tax on corporations. Over 130 countries have signed on, but now Poland raising objections, preventing the European Union from agreeing to it. Here's Congressman Lloyd Doggett, Democrat from Texas, questioning the Treasury Secretary. We know here that after agreeing to uh, the global minimum tax agreement, Poland has come up with uh, last-minute objections either for themselves or on behalf of someone that doesn't want to pay their taxes. Uh, Why is it in the interest of America that we lead instead of follow, that we go first regardless of what the polls say or what the European Union does. This is um, an agreement that is very much in the U.S. national interest. Um, It will um, enable us to um, reduce some of the burden of taxation that currently falls on workers and 
place it on corporations whose contributions relative to our size of our economy has diminished strongly over time. And the agreement contains strong protections. Once we adopt it, um, we can place sanctions on countries that don't go along with it. But I'm very encouraged that most major economies are moving forward in adopting it. Um, the, the European Union, I believe, will adopt it soon. Um, we've talked with Poland, and I'm very hopeful that Poland will soon decide uh, that it's in their interest to agree to this. I've tried to explain uh, to their senior leadership that it is um, not only in the U.S. interest, but also in Poland's interest to um, reduce the prevalence of tax shelters around around the world, and it will help them compete better. Um, Ireland, that was initially um, reticent to join, has come to that perspective. I think the same applies to Poland. Well, and for the United States, this will level the playing field. We're the only country in the world that currently has a minimum tax that we impose on the foreign income of our multinationals. We propose raising it, and the agreement would raise it somewhat, but our competitors have no such tax, and they will move from zero to 15%. And that means that we will be leveling the playing field on behalf of U.S. Companies. So not only does uh, this global minimum tax uh, end some of the distortion in the current tax system that favors uh, those who dodge their taxes versus those domestic businesses that are paying their taxes, not only does it benefit us in not having an incentive to export American jobs, but you're saying that it actually helps many multinationals uh, because of the way their international competitors will be taxed. Congressman Lloyd Doggett, Democrat from Texas, questioning the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen at today's House Ways and Means Committee hearing. Wall Street Journal writing about this issue has this. Congressman Kevin Brady, Republican from Texas, the top Republican on the committee, pressed Ms. Yellen on the other piece of the international tax agreement, the part that allows countries with large consumer bases to expand their corporate taxing rights. Under a multilateral deal being negotiated now, some of those taxing powers would be reallocated from countries that house companies' headquarters, factories, and intellectual property. Mr. Brady warned about the risks of the U.S. ceding some taxing authority and asked whether the administration would walk away from any deal that reduces U.S. revenue. That from the Wall Street Journal. Back to the hearing. So under your global tax plan, you propose Congress give up its taxing authority to foreign, foreign governments, the OECD, and accountants at the Financial Accounting and the International Accounting Standard Board. These aren't just tax uh, provisions on international ta uh, tax, but on research and development, on, on expensing, on uh, local tax um, credits and how they're designed. So how do you convince House tax writers, whose authority is anchored in the Constitution, to cede that authority over our own tax code to foreign governments or to unelected accounting bureaucracies? Well, I guess I would disagree with the characterization that we're ceding our rights to tax income to foreigners, but the agreement does contain an enforcement mechanism in which countries that do not adopt uh, a compliant global minimum tax, that other countries do have uh, the right to ensure Un that unfortunately, Madam multinationals Chairman, pay a minimum I tax. I get it. I, I strongly disagree, and I've read both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, and, and you are not protecting either the U.S. tax code or the way we do our tax credits. Congressman Kevin Brady, ranking Republican on the Ways and Means Committee. He's from Texas, questioning the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. You can find today's House Ways and Means Committee hearing with the Treasury Secretary in its entirety at our website, cspan.org, as well as Tuesday's hearing. She was before the Senate Finance Committee. Wall Street today, the Dow down 269, NASDAQ down 88, S&P down 44. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Get Washington's top stories sent to you every day by subscribing to C-SPAN's evening newsletter word for word. You can sign up at c-span.org forward slash connect. Have a good night. 